he is so renowned and fabulous. Dr. Tom Boyd has won every teaching award that the state of Oklahoma has to offer, particularly the University of Oklahoma. The George Lynn Cross Professor, which of course is the highest honor a professor can achieve here at the University of Oklahoma. Also, what you need to know is why is he coming to talk in strategies? One is the fact because he is renowned for being a student advocate. Dr. Boyd was the first faculty in residence to live in the residence halls. He started that program. No other one, no choice could have been better to start that program. And um, students come back year after year and say what an influence he's been on their lives. Dr. Boyd speaks reality but he puts it in a very interesting uh, framework for students of strategies. And as I was telling Dr. Boyd, I was walking over this morning thinking, he's the only one who's been in these classes as much as I have. <laughs> so he started the first semester with us, and he's come every semester to speak to strategy students. So I think that tells you how committed he is to you and also to this program. So. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Tom Boyd. You're here because you're a failure. You flunked. Think about it. That's rude, isn't it? It doesn't sound right, but it's true. But now you're inhabiting a course. It's called Strategies for what? Success. success. Oh, success. Everybody wants to be a success. That word bothers me. It really does. Because there's a question in it. At what? If you are a bank robber, and you really pull off the crime and you get away with it, you're a success. The word is highly ambiguous. It doesn't really help us very much. Furthermore, I have come to believe that failure is important. Not, not in all cases, not in every instance, but failure is fundamental. I once gave a commencement address at a high school on the importance of failure and nobody liked it because in America that is un-American to talk about failure but it's real for example I almost died by touching an electrical cord with a short in it and I've never done it since that was a profound moment of failure but it was highly educational Therefore, what I am earnest about is the idea that we penetrate this business of failure and success because success is a huge word in our culture. Now, isn't it? I mean, yeah, don't you want to be a success? In fact, I taught ninth grade English for Texans who don't even speak that language <laughs> in which... On every Monday morning, I had to sit in a little room because my first hour was called my off course and I wasn't teaching. But next door in a room was a woman counseling and she would counsel students. Well, it so happened that every Monday morning this one student would appear while I was in the other room. And this other student was a 17-year-old ninth grader. Does that give you any images? Every time she, he would come in, she would, before it was over, ask him one question. Don't you want to be a success? And I kept wanting to sneak in and whisper to him, ask her the question, ask her the question, at what? Later that year, he... Uh, got mad at another student and brought a log chain 
about that long, and whacked the other student on his head, fractured his skull. Very successfully. <laughs> I never saw him after that, but <laughs> but we act like we know what success is and what it would look like and we're asking the wrong question because the establishment has it all laid out as to how you are to be a success you're to do certain things, follow certain protocols behave, mind your business, sit down, shut up, keep your desk straight and the whole system does that when my son decided to go to the University of Texas, damn it, and uh, <laughs> was about to enter the first year, he came to me and said, Dad, you've been in this racket a long time. What should I know? And I said, this is what you should know. And this was awful advice. I'm not very good at it. I said, start with this premise. The University of Texas doesn't give a damn about me. Start with that premise. And if you will go through that system doing what the system tells you to do as best you can without losing your mind, then when you get through they will give you a little square hat and call you educated. Now I was being crass and crude. I was doing it on purpose. I am now. Sometimes you just have to take the rag off the bush and look at things. And what I was telling him, he's in a huge system. And huge systems are involved in their own survival. What the University of Oklahoma is interested in is the University of Oklahoma. It wants to do well. Now, on the little introductory sheets that they tell the students, they're all here for you. Don't you forget it. As long as you play the system. As long as you live in the system. Now, it took me a while to learn this. When I finally learned it, I learned, and I live in these systems. I've, I've taught for 39 years at this university. And um, I, I know pretty well how the system works, more or less. And I have things in the system I don't like. Yet no system is perfect. Can't do it. Sometimes I get ticked off about it. You want things to work better. You want things to be more adequate. We all do that. My goodness. How many of you are in families? How many of you don't know who you're in? Or what you're in? Okay, several. Okay. If you're in a family, is it perfect? Have you ever run into a perfect family? No. There are systems of interaction that are very powerful and very important to us. But there's no such thing as a perfect system. I've had four children to get old enough to come home and tell me how I botched it. <laughs> so what we have to do is exercise our minds in relationship to these systems. Because it's in the mediation that these systems provide that we constantly talk about success. But here is my question. We're asking the wrong question. How do I succeed? Wrong question. Prior question. What's worth doing? What is worth my time and energy? Now most of us have very, very navel-gazing, subjective ways of answering that. What's worth doing is what I like. Oh, come on. One, half the time we don't know really what we like. Then when we do know what we like, it probably isn't worth liking. Or we'll change our minds and like something else next week. Therefore, we've got to get a good sense of the difference between what I need and what I want and the relationship between what I want and what I need and to try to bring those together around some sense of what is worth doing. That is hard stuff, folk. It takes a long time to get my wanting and my needing in a conversation with each other. If I go to the doctor and I need 
a shot. I've never e particularly wanted a shot, you know. But I need a shot. So, well, I don't want the shot, but I need the shot. I decide I want it because, why? It meets a larger need. See, we live in that want and need nexus all the time. What is worth doing? If you haven't begun to ask that question, then your problems with academics is right there. Start asking that question and get inside the question. What do I want in relationship to what I need? And what is the nexus in which I solve that problem? How do I go about it? Now, here is the very most important thing in this lecture. I'm not going to solve this. One, I don't know how. And two, I'm still working on it myself. See, I'm old enough that I've got to decide how to succeed at dying. <laughs> now, the first thing you do in, in succeeding at dying is put it off. <laughs> right? Postpone it a little later, and I hope so. But I've got to deal with it anyway. And the older I get, the more I will deal with it. Right? And some of you are totally ignoring it right now, although you're going to kick off before tomorrow morning. I wasn't just pointing at you, sorry. But, <laughs> but you see the problem. And therefore, it never lets up. This issue I'm talking about, about success, about living well, is not something you get solved on Thursday and then have the rest of your life. That's ridiculous. I'm still working on living adequately the life I have to live. And I would like to have a healthy death. That sounds bizarre. How do you have a healthy death? If we had a month, I'd talk about that. I'm not going to talk about it. Think about it. I'm not going to answer the question I'm raising. What is worth doing? I'm only going to give you some strategies. This is a course on strategies for success. I'm not going to give you answers to strategies for success. I'm going to give you some strategies about asking the right question about success. Namely, what's worth doing? Strategy number one. I have, I have three of them. They're brilliant, so write them down. <laughs> Strategy number one. Become Ignorant. Of course you are ignorant. You're dumb as stumps. And I'm not trying to put you down because I am too. The difference is this. I've learned that I am dumb. One, I will always be dumb. I will go crawling into the grave Bearing my dumbness. And there means simply there's no way out of ignorance except to live in the possibilities of the knowing within our ignorance. That is, the more I know, the more I realize I don't know. Because I learn bigger pictures. I learn more grand, grandiose things that could be known that I don't know yet. So I hang around with a bunch of other people trying to know stuff. <coughs> right. I do it all the time. That's one of the reasons I hang around with my wife. She knows stuff I don't know. And I'm trying to steal some of it. Some of you in this room right now know far more than I know about some subject or some theme. It's always that way. But the more we create a community of knowing and an exchange of knowing, wow. But you never know anything until you become ignorant and know that you're ignorant. I didn't invent that. I stole it from Socrates. <laughs> Said, I'm the wisest man in all Athens because I don't know anything but no, and no one else does, but I know that. So, become ignorant. Become ignorant and embrace your ignorance. You know why I did so well in school? I came out of East Texas 
And I went to college and I was convinced that I would flunk the first semester. There was nothing I could do about it because I was so stupid. But I didn't flunk. I didn't flunk because unknown to me I was embracing my own ignorance and facing up to it so I could learn something. Now most of us are terrified of our ignorance. The reason you're terrified of your ignorance is because it is embarrassing. For example, in my courses, I have a lot of courses like this, in which I get students to talk to me, but there are students who will never say anything. Mm -hmm. No, don't say anything. Don't say anything. Really? And what, what is the... I, I could get it wrong. Well, you will almost all the time get it wrong. Some way, ways in which I don't even know you've got it wrong. You mean you're going to wait around to do a perfect knowledge and then declare it to the world? Bullshit. You know, that is not how it works. That's not how life works. It's not how learning works. It is to let your ignorance out so you can find out its real ignorance and learn to do something about it in response to it. That's heavy work, isn't it? So you've got to share your own understanding and misunderstanding and let the devil take the hindmost. I've been wrong so many times, I've gotten used to it. But every time I'm wrong, you know what happens? I learn something. You know what I learned? You were wrong. Good start. Get dumb. Let ignorance be there. You cannot get an education without it. And there are people at this university who know an enormous amount of stuff. Far more than I'll ever can even sense that I could know. And so I hang with them. And I hang out among them. And you know what? I like to hang out with people who are smarter than I am. When I high school, I learned this indirectly by learning that I played tennis much better if I played against a good tennis player than if I played against a bad one. You do better. So I'd try to play against the best tennis players because they'd almost always beat me. But at the same time, I did better and learned more about tennis by playing them. So don't be afraid of your own ignorance. Don't be afraid of entering the community because the community is a place of shared ignorance as well as learning. Start there. But not only are we terrified of our own ignorance, terrified someone will find out that we don't know anything. We're so terrified of it. But here's the way we handle it. If I present myself you know, as suave enough and cool enough, nobody will know. They'll think I'm smart too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Here's the way it happens around the academy. I, sometimes professors drive me crazy. You know, we're all prima donnas. But here, a professor will come up to me and say, uh, of course you've read such and such, yes, yes. And, you know, here's the game you're supposed to play. You're supposed to answer, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where you never heard of the damn book before. <laughs> now, I want to tell you how you mess them up. Somebody say, oh, you've read such a thing. I say, no, I have not read that. Tell me about it. And they say, well, I haven't read it yet either. I really uh, heard a review of it. I said, <laughs> you too. Nobody's as smart as they think they are. But then, you're supposed to pretend? Mm -hmm. When I went to Yale University, and I started in my first year, I was again pretty terrified, you know. I'm pretty dumb. I'm from Texas. There's some problems. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I took a course. Mysticism and naturalism, of course, in philosophy. Very heady. 
the professor kept using Latin phrases. Well, hell, I didn't know Latin. I, you know, I'm not a Catholic. Uh, so, I, you know, what do you mean speaking this Latin all the time? One day, it got so intense, he kept using a Latin phrase. And I, the way he was using it, I thought, man, this has got to be complicated. And so I raised my hand. I'm in the back of the class. Raised my hand. I said, Dr. Christian, that was his name, Dr. Christian. He wasn't. But, <laughs> but I... Uh, I said, what is this word you're saying, this conditio sine thing? And he said, oh, the whole class erupted in laughter. I had dared at the Yale University to confess I didn't know something. So the whole class laughed. Well, you know, I thought, huh. How did I find this out? But at the same time, there was a student on the front row. Now, here's the way these students looked. He wore a sports jacket with leather elbows. You ever seen those? Uh huh. And, because you could do this in those days, he smoked a pipe. This is how you show your erudition. You smoke pipe and blow smoke up into the air. And don't take any notes and pretend that you are understanding everything. <laughs> Asshole. And, uh, <laughs> and he sat on the front row. Here's how he sat. Sat on the front row like this. So when I asked my dumbass question, he laughed the loudest. So Dr. Christian said, Would you tell Mr. Boyd what conditio sine qua non means? He didn't know. You know, he mumbled a few. Well, you know, it depends on the context. Blah, blah, blah. He didn't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the most incredible educational moments in my entire life. Because I suddenly realized they're ignorant too. They just smoke pipes. <laughs> We gotta, we gotta do something about this. And it was very relieving to me to realize that I didn't have to play with his image. I didn't have to follow that kind of pomp and circumstances. What you do is get with it. Ask the question. Get involved because we're ignorant. That's the first thing. Second principle follows from the first one. You've got to discover yourself. This has historically been called the great task of self-knowledge. It goes way back to the ancient world. In fact, over the famous temple of Delphi in ancient Greece, where so many people went to get answers to their problems, over the door of the temple at Delphi, it says, in English translation of course, know thyself. That's the hardest thing in the world and the thing we presume to know most often. We're always presuming, oh yeah, yeah, myself. I see myself in the mirror regularly and all that kind of stuff. No, no, that is not self-knowledge. Self-knowledge is the most difficult task of all, to be deeply aware of yourself. Now, of course, we are aware of our immediate feelings, our desires, and all of this stuff that is uh, belching out of us all the time. We're aware of those things, and we call that self-knowledge. That just ego fixation it isn't self-knowledge at all. Self-knowledge is difficult work. And there are certain elements that go in to the beginning and unfoldment of self-knowledge, of knowing ourselves. And if you think, I've got self-knowledge and I know myself, don't go there. I'm still working on it. I work on it all my life. And I work on it constantly because I'm aware of certain things. One, I cannot blame my life on anybody else. Now this is what parents are for. To blame your life on someone. Well, you know, if it wasn't for you. <laughs> right? And then later you transfer that to your wife or husband if it weren't for you 
And then you will begin to blame it on your children, you little jerk baits, if it weren't for you. <laughs> we spend our life. It goes all the way back to the ancient myth in the Garden of Eden where Adam is approached by the deity and said, did you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And Adam says, well, the, my wife did. <laughs> and then the wife says, no, it was a snake. We've been copping out ever since. The first order of business is to discover that your life is yours. It belongs to you, and you've got to take it on, and take it up, and quit blaming things on, I don't have enough money, or I don't have enough time, or I'm not old enough yet, or it doesn't matter what it is. We play excuses out the wazoo. We play excuses to keep from dealing with ourselves. It's very easy to see the world out there as my problem. In fact, it's very easy simply to live such an external life that we never start the process of looking within ourselves at all. I wonder, I, I won't ask for a show of hands, but think about this. I wonder how many of you in the last month have used the word bored at least once. I'm bored. That was boring. Uh-huh. Well over a hundred years ago, a philosopher named Kierkegaard said that in the next hundred years, the word boredom will become one of the central words in our language. Now, he was speaking Danish at the time, so it wasn't the English word boredom, but it was the equivalent. Boredom is a stupid curse. And it's a curse of people who haven't begun to look inward. They haven't gone anywhere toward their inwardness. My daughter was 11. She's 36 now, but she was 11 once. And uh, she came into the bedroom. I was standing there and she flopped down on the bed and said, I'm bored. I said, really? Huh, I don't know how to do that. Show me. And you know, she, she said, oh, you know. I said, no, don't. I don't understand boredom. Tell me. She said, I don't have anything to do. I said, ha! Think of all the things you can do. She said, like what? I said, eat lunch and walk south. <laughs> What do you mean there's nothing to do? I gave up boredom. Gave up boredom years ago. It's called faculty meetings. <laughs> you go sit there and you know that this is going to go on forever. And they're going to argue about things. And so, I just go somewhere else. Now, I, mind you, I'm there. I even uh, did it like this way sometimes. <laughs> Things like that. <laughs> but I'm really somewhere else. So I don't know how to be bored. I'm not into that. I've got even a better fantasy life than that. But to seriously go inward, to seriously go inward is to is to challenge boredom altogether. To challenge the idea that someone out there or something out there, I can be entertained or I can go buy crap at the, at the, at the mall, our temple today. And, and I, can, I can do things out there or if I can't do them, I'm going to be bored. Ridiculous. To take on our own lives is to take on our own interiority. And if we don't go inward, we will be bored. But our culture is arrayed against interior life. You're not supposed to ever think about an interior life. You're supposed to buy something. Turn on the TV. Watch something. Electronics, a great boon to us. In fact, I'm wearing a little piece of it right now. You don't know it. They're, they're taping me for posterity or something. Oh, yeah. It's out the wazoo. And we think it's so great. It can destroy you. 
It can destroy you because you think, if I get preoccupied with enough stuff, and enough stuff coming at me, and I listen to enough stuff superficially enough, I won't have to really learn anything. I don't have to go through the anguish of trying to break a code, trying to find out what something is. I can just look it up. No, that's not how life works. To go inside is difficult work. And the difficult work begins once you take on the task with this difficulty. This is the most difficult thing. The only way you can begin self-knowledge, once you've given up on blaming everything on everyone else, and you've given up the external world as the source of all of your meaning, then you have to learn an art. It's called self-suspicion. Have you ever caught yourself being a jerk? Doing idiotic things? Well, part of self-knowledge and inwardness is to recognize that. But don't dismiss it. Don't dismiss it as though, well, I'm just that way. I had a student come to me, and students have done this before, but one day it just hit me. This student came to me and said, I'm the kind of person who. Have you ever done that? I'm the kind of person who. And so I responded by saying, why don't you quit being that kind and start being another kind? <laughs> What I was just trying to do is get him to reflect a little bit because he was saying, this is the kind of persona I've developed. See, it's right here. It's here all the time. This is me. I'm it. Really? Therefore, you've got to be suspicious of yourself. I do a lot of work suspecting myself, wondering what are my motives? Why in the world did I say that? Why did I do that? That certainly did upset them. Goodness, I shouldn't have talked that way. Why should I do that? I came by self-suspicion fairly, fairly honestly, really. I had, a, I had a father who was, <coughs> he's a very devout man, a very earnest man, he was quiet, but he was, I never saw him do a mean thing in my life. And, uh, but one Sunday we'd gotten home from church and uh, something had happened to church. I was eight or nine years old, I didn't know. Something had happened and it upset dad and mother too and they were talking about it at lunch. My brother and I sitting there at lunch just being quiet because they were really going into it and I didn't know what it was about. And finally my dad just blurted out, well if people are going to behave that way they shouldn't even come to church. And my dad didn't talk that way, so I just went. And then I heard my dad cry. Yeah. He's just a regular guy, by the way. But I heard him cry. So I looked up at him. And he looked at me and said, I want you boys to forgive me. A person shouldn't talk that way. When you're eight years old and your father confesses he's imperfect, that's startling. It's amazing. It's a revelation. Oh, well it's all right then for me to look at myself and when I botch it to confess it and deal with it rather than hide out from it. I have a daughter who's Buddhist. She lived at a Buddhist monastery in Scotland for two years and we went there to visit her while she was there and um, she took me to meet the Lama. The Lama was from Tibet, he was a teacher, he was in his senior years and so we had a conversation. In the conversation I don't know why I, this, I asked him this but I said you know you've come from a, a very a different country, Tibet, uh, all the way to the west, you're living in, you know, living here in Scotland. What has been the biggest surprise for you in coming here? I just thought that was an interesting question. And so he said, anger. I thought, anger? Is your... He said, yes. You people don't know what to do with it. You either stuff it inside and deny you're angry, or you blurt it out and hurt somebody. 
And I thought, well, what's the alternative? And he said, let it educate you. Learn from it. Pay attention to it. Have you ever paid attention to your anger? Or sadness? Sort of, it doesn't matter what the emotion is. Have you ever paid attention to it? It's yours. It isn't anybody else's. You know, here's what we say. You make me so mad. No! When you said that, I got mad. It's mine. So I come back from Scotland, and a few days later, I'm driving down Highway 9, going off to the west side to do something important. And um, a guy cut me off. I mean, he nearly hit me. You know? I was angry. I was angry instantly. <laughs> Have you noticed that's how anger works? Have you ever said, I'm going to get angry tomorrow morning? <laughs> no, you don't. That's not how it happens. Something happens and you just go, bleh. <clears throat> but then I remembered the Lama's words. Ah, ha, ha. And I started saying, okay, why am I angry? Well, of course, I'm an important person. And, and he just cut me off. Probably a student. <laughs> frat rat, you know, and <laughs> cut, cut me off, and how dare he do it, you know? Then all of a sudden I thought, you're an idiot. You are crazy. Getting angry like this and going to, and so this is going to ruin your day, right? You're going to, get, you're not going to do anything about it. You're not going to hit him from behind. You're, you're just going to, you're going to go and say, well, how can I dare he do that? Blah, 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 blah. And you spend the rest of your friggin' day letting that define you. That's why self-knowledge is important. And self-knowledge is not just intellectual talk. It is getting in touch with yourself, your emotions, the depth, and the reaches of your life, paying attention to it. Quit blaming it on someone else. Self-knowledge is hard. Let me tell you a story about self-knowledge. I had a student several years ago. He came uh, to the university a second time. He had flunked out the first time because he got into drugs and was playing in a band, not studying, doing his work. And when he came back, he'd cleaned up, decided he wanted to go to school, and he came, took a course from me, and then we started becoming acquainted and talking and doing things and he aced everything. He was a really good student for the next uh, two and a half years. In the third year, he met a young woman who's very uh, ambitious, very, uh, very bright, and uh, they fell in love. And in fact, they got engaged. Now, I'll call him Alex. Um, Alex was on, on the clouds. He was really, really going for it. He was a senior. Everything was going fine. And she dropped him. I mean, it broke off the engagement, broke the whole relationship. I won't go into why. She just did. Well, the next time I saw him, of course, he was a basket case. He came into my office blubbering and carrying on and crying. And it was a loss. It was painful to him. And, and, and you know what he said in the middle of it? He said, no woman has ever left me before. Well, get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> this went on for two weeks. I mean, every time he'd come in, he'd break out crying. He was so upset, so disturbed, full of all the emotions, anger, sadness, a bit of revenge. Finally, I said, Alex, do you want to get over this? Do you want to get over this? Get through it. Let it be your lesson. He said, yes, yes, I'll do anything. Ever. I said, will you do what I tell you? He said, yes. I said, okay. Two weeks from now is uh, spring break. I want you to get in your car and drive to New Mexico. I have a friend out there, and I want you to go to him, and he will fix you. So sure enough, he got in the car and he drove out to New Mexico and I told him where to go up the Pecos River and into uh, a little cabin where my friend lived and uh, he didn't know what was going to happen to him. 
But I had I'd, I'd called my friend and told him about it and said, uh, see to him. Well, my friend, he's still a very de devoted, a devoted friend now. We, we love each other, but uh, uh, he doesn't talk much. He's a silent type. So when Alex walked into the cabin, my buddy greeted him and said, you can sleep up there in that little attic if you want to. I'll see you in the morning. I'll wake you up. And that's the end of it. Next morning, about 6 o'clock, he woke Alex up, and Alex came downstairs. My friend said, here, here's a jug of water, two and a half gallons. And here's a big piece of plastic. Take those. They started walking. Now, to make a long story short, they walked about eight miles. But uh, because Alex didn't know where they were, he didn't know where he was when they were walking. He didn't know anything about it. He was in the mountains, walking around, walking around. They walked a long way around, long way around, long way around, crossed a river, and walked further. And then finally they came on the top of this, this uh, it, it was a hill really, it wasn't a mountain, that was a very mountainous region, but it was just a hill up there. And there was a little kind of dugout place, natural, all grassy and stuff. And he said, uh, sit there and wait for me. He went away. Now Alex waited there all day and nothing happened. And uh, it got dark and he was still there and all he had was this water and a piece of plastic in case it rained. And um, well, I, he waited there four days. He only got out to go urinate and defecate and came back and sat there. Wow. Have you ever been with yourself that long? Have you ever just been with yourself for one rainy afternoon with no music to distract you? Nothing. You said to be there. It can be devastating. And it's powerful stuff. On the morning of the fourth day, he was sitting there. He is almost resigned to it all. He had even gone out sometimes and looked around to see if he could find my friend. He couldn't find him. And he was sitting there, cross-legged, with his hands on his knees, and a butterfly lit right on his right hand. Just lit. And he, he was so impressed with it. He just suddenly, he was totally engaged with this butterfly. It was so beautiful, so powerful. And it flew away. He then went into the wails of misery. Everybody leaves me. <laughs> I'm just out here all by myself. My girlfriend left me. Blah, blah, blah. And the butterfly came back and lit on his hand in the same place. You have to know about butterflies. And he changed his life. A little while later, my buddy came out of the trees, came over and said, you're ready to go. They went back down the mountain. The cabin was just below the hill. But Alex didn't know that. Um, and he came home telling me it's the most important event in his life. He said, I've never been with myself that long. I've never spent any kind of time there. Now what we know and what I want you to know is that he was in a vision quest. That's what the native people call it. You go and cry for a vision. And usually you go into the wilderness. And usually your vision is related to some form of animal life. Powerful. That's the inner life. Most of us know so little about it. Finally, you must become decisional. Very few people make very many decisions in a lifetime. We think we do. 
Actually, we're following the program. Actually, we think we are deciding when we are simply going along with everybody else and everything else. So, if I had a long time, I would talk to you about decision in great depth, but I'm going to dissolve it into one question. Why in the hell are you here? You do not have to be in this room. You do not have to be at the University of Oklahoma. If you're going to come here and flunk out, why? It's ridiculous. And it's not anybody else's fault. It's not your fault. It's just you're asleep. And when you become decisional, things happen. Become decisional, take on your life. Not just do what mom and dad said they wanted us to do. I don't mean to dishonor parents. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about becoming your own person. And that means you've got to make decisions yourself about your own life. Nobody's going to do that for you. And if they do, you've given up your life. It's very difficult to, to become decisional. So I'll tell you one story and we'll quit. I had a student, uh, this has been several years ago. Uh, in fact, a bunch of years ago, it was the late 70s. But uh, he came into my office horrified. He said, Dr. Board, I'm going to flunk. I'm going to flunk out. I'm going to flunk everything. I can, and, I, and he came to me because he was making a D in my course, which is his highest grade. And, and so he said, what can I do? My dad's going to kill me. Really? And uh, I said, well, what have you thought of doing? Well, he, you know, he just was a basket case. He couldn't, get, he couldn't get it straight. But all of a sudden, I found myself just saying, why don't you leave? Why don't you get out of here? Go somewhere else. Do something else. You're not very good at this. <laughs> and he said, well, where do I go? What would I do? My dad's going to kill me. His dad evidently was a monster. He was a medical doctor, but well, you know, that, that's another story. I thought they tried to save lives, but anyway. He said, I've always, I said, where would you like to go? If you could do exactly what you wanted to do right now, what would you do? And he said, I would have a backpack on hitchhiking to Lake Tahoe. He had been out there on vacation. He liked it. I said, well, why in the hell aren't you doing it? And that's all I did. I just confronted him. He left. About four days later, I get a knock on my office door, open the door, and there's a guy with a backpack, and it's him. Looks like a, a very small guy in terms of that backpack, but he said, I'm out of here. <laughs> and he left, and I didn't see him for a long time, a couple of years. And he came back, because I ran into him on the south over. I said, you're back. He said, yes, yes, I got back. I was going to come by to see you, but blah, blah, blah. He had discovered something. Without his education, all he could find to do in Ta Lake Tahoe was to wash dishes. And he got tired of that. He came back to school because he decided to come back to school. And he got an education. That's decisional. There are a lot of ways to do it. Become decisional. Have a great day.